the way, how many of you are enjoying this conference so far? Good, okay. And how many of you came to the stuff yesterday? And the earlier stuff? Oh, most of you, okay, good. So you've, you've learned good stuff so far? And you expect to learn more? Yeah, stuff you're going to implement and make happen as part of your vision? Do you realize there are people back where you work who are dreading your return? <laughs> Oh, every time she goes to one of these things, she comes back with all these crazy ideas, you know. <laughs> Just give her time, she'll forget it. Yeah, she'll get over it, you know. <laughs> Load her up with other work. <laughs> Held the book up and said, okay, this is Larry Johnson, co-author of Absolute Honesty. Mr. Johnson, Absolute Honesty, are you telling me that you're supposed to be absolutely honest all the time? And I said, well, whenever you can, of course, you know. Honesty is important. He said, okay, so your daughter comes down the stairs on prom night and she's wearing a dress that you, um, you hate. And she says, how do I look, Dad? He said, what would you say to her? I said, I'd look her right in the eye and lie through my teeth. <laughs> He said, but I thought you said you're supposed to be absolutely honest. I said, yeah, but not, not absolutely stupid. <laughs> and there's stories about Ray Kroc where he would come into McDonald's, just show up at a McDonald's and, uh, and do an inspection. In fact, he did one inspection in Ontario, Canada, walked in and he found a dead fly in the grease where they fry the french fries. Ugh. And so, you know what he did? He shut the place down. Fired, didn't fire, he fired everybody. Didn't fire the manager, fired everybody. Closed the restaurant down, and then get this, he brought a bulldozer out and had the building bulldozed and sold the property. Now, you could ask, why would he do that? Well, he's crazy. <laughs> it was Looney Tunes. <laughs> But he sure established a clear value about if for that corporation, didn't he? Quality, service, cleanliness, and value. Poor Tim here, he still thinks about it. 22 years later. Back in the 70s, Xerox wanted to change the office environment. And so they put a, together a team of real smart people, put them out in Palo Alto, California, and said, come up with new and cool stuff. And they came up with GUI which was essentially a way to make a computer so user-friendly that it would eventually create a paperless office. And they went to top management back in New York and put it on the t out and said, here it is, isn't this great? Now, can you put yourself in their place trying to convince the executives of a copier company <laughs> that you have technology to create a paperless office? <laughs> Yeah, my guess is we're not getting it, most of us not getting enough, and sometimes we have the pleasure, quote unquote, of working for somebody who's a, you know, a praise miser. Sort of takes the attitude, my people know they're doing a good job when they don't hear from me. You ever work for somebody like that? That's like the guy that tells his wife, I told you I loved you when we got married. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> Hey, and that's special. <laughs> you see, if that guy behind the counter in New Orleans that had just managed my perception of the event, if he'd had just thought about how I was perceiving it, he, he could have done it t entirely differently. For one thing, he could have acted like he cared. How many of you would swear that the person you dealt with when you took that solemn vow was somebody who doesn't care? Would you raise your hand? Yeah. We've got a big majority of hands here. So, uh, this guy behind the counter, I think all he had to do was just act like he cared. Even if he didn't. He could have just faked it. He could have said, I can see you're in a hurry. Okay, I'm going to put this through, through as quickly as I can. Now, I can't promise they'll hold it, but I'll call down and see if they'll hold the plane. Now you run. That's all he had to do. And even if he didn't really care, after I ran off, he could have gone... <laughs> And my perception of the entire experience would have been entirely different.
The problem is it's only half the argument because all you did was tell me why it won't work. That's known as whining. I don't like it. Stupid. <laughs> Along with the whine, what should he bring? Cheese. Cheese. <laughs> no, not cheese. Is there anybody in this room who enjoys using MS DOS? Don Shaw. Well, Don. You are the nerd in the room. <laughs> yeah, if I'd asked for your input, would, it, would you have, might have cooperated a little more? Sure. Sure, yeah. You know, this is such a powerful concept. My daughter taught me this concept when she was very young. She was about six years old. And at the time, I was working in the construction industry. And it was 1974. Anybody remember what happened in 1974? There's an oil embargo. I know some of, some of you are going, huh? I wasn't born. Yeah. Yeah, the oil embargo and Nixon resigned and the, and the economy went in the toilet. And this little construction company I had, basically I had to you know, liquidate and fire everybody who worked for me. I just couldn't afford to operate. We didn't work for over a year. So we were financially pretty tight. And my, my daughter, who I tend to spoil, she continued to want things. And she would say, Daddy, can I have a new, uh, a new bike? And I'd say, no. Well, why not? Well, we don't have the money. What do you mean we don't have the money? We don't have the money. We can't afford it. Why well, saw money in your wallet? Well, that's, that's for different things. Well, why can't I spend it on a bike? And then I'd say, because I said so. That's standard management practice, right? Well, one, one evening, my wife overheard us having one of these arguments, and she said, Larry, why don't we include her when we write the checks and pay the bills so that she will understand where the money goes, so she gets a bigger picture? Now, this was 25 years ago, almost 30. I was a whole lot younger. I had lots more testosterone than I do now. I think it's all drained out. And, and I say, what? Open my checkbook to my, my six-year-old kid? I don't think so. And, and my wife said, why not? And I said, well, she, she wouldn't understand it. And my wife said, Larry, what's there to understand? Zero is zero. <laughs> And after a while, I thought about it. I said, well, okay. So uh, we, I wanted to illustrate it. And um, I didn't have enough dollars on hand to do it with cash. So I used some, some little building blocks, those Lego kind of things that she had. I put them in the middle of the dining room table. And I said, now, sweetheart, let's pretend that each one of these is a dollar. I said, here's how many dollars we get every month right now. I said, now, here's how many we have to send to the bank because the bank owns our house. And if we don't pay the bank, they'll take our house away. I said, and here's how many dollars we spend on our car. Because the bank owns our car. And if we don't pay them, they'll take our car away. I said, and here's how much we have left for food and clothes. And that's, we spend that every month. And until mommy or daddy gets a job and we're looking, I said, that's how it is. And if you have any ideas, we'd love to hear those ideas. <laughs> without saying a word, she got up and she went into her room and she came out with her piggy bank. She said, here, Daddy, will this help? I got to tell you, I, I thought I'd cry. Anyway, after I took the piggy bank, I... <laughs> Kidding. Just kidding. But I was, I was tempted. It was real heavy. I said, where'd you get all this money? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Justin, I could have I told you why. Included you in this decision. That would have